All right. Good morning, everyone. Hope all of you had a good Thanksgiving. Um, we got back from Oklahoma City yesterday afternoon, and uh, it was a good trip. A good trip. Liam is always getting spoiled when he's with his grandparents and aunts. So that's a. <laughs> Uh, just one quick announcement. I know that Christmas is coming, and so you're probably all looking for something to get for whoever. Um, next year, as we've been putting up here on the PowerPoint, um, sometime in the first quarter, whenever we finish up Galatians, we're going to be starting our series on doctrine. And one of the primary sources that I'm going to be using to prepare those sermons is this book right here, Doctrine by Mark Driscoll and Jerry Brashears. And I think it would be awesome if every family in the church went and picked up a copy of this book and every week read the chapter uh, that we're going to be going over so that you all can be prepared as well. And it'd be a great resource just to have in your homes too. So anyway, Doctrine by Mark Driscoll and Jerry Brashears. Um, you can pick it up on Amazon. I think it's about $15 or something like that. Uh, our passage this morning is going to be Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. This is the last uh, little bit of Paul's long autobiographical section at the beginning of the book. Uh, and in this section, things get a little heated. Now, let me go ahead and read it for us. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Now, I don't know if this has ever happened to you. Um, you're at home, maybe one of your kids, maybe your spouse, getting on your nerves a little bit, and you get into a little bit of an argument, things get a little heated, and then the phone rings. You know what I'm talking about, right? You, you, things are, you're arguing and things are a little heated and then the phone rings and you pick it up. Hello, how may I bless you today? <laughs> you know, uh, you kind of have this, this phone answering pretense that, that we all put on from time to time. We want when, when we answer the phone people to think that, that everything is going great with us. Well, in the passage today, we see Peter and Barnabas and the other Jewish Christians in Antioch, that they put on a sort of pretense, a mask, that said they were all about living the gospel of grace. Now, this was manifested in their fellowship with the Gentile Christians, but, but when their feet were held to the fire and they, faced, they were faced with disappointing their religious friends from Jerusalem, they chose conformity to religious traditions over the freedom that comes from Jesus Christ and the gospel of grace. Now, if you look uh, at verse 12, we're going to come back to verse 11. But if you look at verse 12, if all we had in verse 12 was Peter was eating with the Gentiles, wouldn't that be awesome if all we had was, was that verse right there? And then we dove right into the, the rest of the book of Galatians. Because if all we had was that, we could have just tacked that on to last week's sermon where we talked about unity because this would have been a beautiful picture of, of the gospel at work, of Jews and Gentiles unified together under the gospel of grace. Uh, Peter, a Jew, sitting down with his Gentile brothers and sisters and eating with them. How great would that be? But traditional Jews viewed this as highly suspect, and that was the problem that arose. Now, because of this, because of the gospel... Peter could sit down with these Gentiles. He could eat with them. He could eat whatever they were eating. You remember, uh, Jewish Christians typically observed their traditional food laws. That means that they kept kosher. They, they didn't eat pork and things like that. They wouldn't eat unclean things. But Peter was sitting down with these Gentile believers, fellowshipping with them, taking the Lord's Supper with them, uh, 
eating bacon with them, and it was all great. Unity. What a beautiful picture of unity we have here. But, but, unfortunately, it doesn't stop there. We have the rest of verse 12. And it says that Peter began to draw back. He began to separate himself, fearing the circumcision party. So, at first, We see Peter exercising his freedom in Christ. He's eating with these Gentiles. It's all good. Uh, He's praying with them, fellowshipping with them, going to church with them, doing all these things that show unity. But then the people from the Jerusalem church show up. And Peter begins to backslide. He begins to conform to legalism rather than continuing to exercise his freedom in Christ. Now, I kind of find this ironic. Um, if you know anything about Peter, you know he kind of has a a checkered past. Um, His name, Peter, in the Greek, Petros, means rock. And if you look back in the Gospels, like in Mark chapter 8, 31 through 33, this is where, uh, where Peter got up in Jesus' face and Jesus condemned Peter. Uh, because Peter was trying to keep Jesus from going on his mission to the cross. Um, the, one of the more popular examples would be Peter denying he even knew Jesus Christ. This is Peter, the rock, right? He doesn't sound much like a rock. He just kind of gets blown about by whatever is convenient for him. Uh, in the first case, he didn't want Jesus to go to the cross because Peter was looking for a political savior, someone to liberate the Jews from Roman occupation. And if Jesus goes to Jerusalem and goes to the cross, well, that's not good for Peter. When Jesus is on trial uh, in the last hours of his life and Peter's standing outside there and he's asked if he knows Jesus, Peter says, no, 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 three times he denies knowing Jesus. Why? For Peter's own self-interest. And so we kind of have this picture of Peter that Even though his name means rock, he kind of gets blown about by whatever is convenient for him. And again, we see that here. Peter exercising this beautiful picture of Christian liberty, of Christian freedom, when confronted with the circumcision party from Jerusalem, he begins to pull back because he feared what they would think of him. And so... It's interesting because it says he drew back and separated himself. Now, Peter didn't just immediately stop what he was doing. Instead, he kind of gradually untangled himself from the Gentile Christians. Maybe one time he showed up to dinner and he brought his own food because he didn't want uh, the Jewish Christians to think bad of him because he wasn't keeping kosher. And then slowly but surely, he pulls back ever more, conforming ever more to legalism until he's erecting this wall between himself and the Gentile Christians. Now, why was this a problem? I mean, why couldn't you just have the the Jewish Christians over here, you know, keeping their traditional uh, laws and festivals, and then the Gentile Christians over here doing their own thing? Well... It created a division within the church. And this was terrible during that time because of the the persecutions and all these different things that would arise from time to time. And the church had to be unified. And especially someone like Peter, who when he falls back, when he falls back into legalism, what is he doing? He's pulling other people with him. Uh, If you look at verse 13, what do we see here? And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas, even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. Now, Peter, he was a respected leader of the church. Uh, He was an apostle. People would come to him. They'd ask his opinion. They'd they'd seek him out. Um, And he was setting a great example initially by eating with the Gentiles. And you... and. From this passage, we learn that other people followed his example. Other Jewish Christians came in and said, hey, this is great. Peter's doing this. Let's follow his example. He's a leader in the church. We'll sit down and we'll eat with our Gentile brothers and sisters as well. And then Paul includes by name Barnabas. Now, that's significant because Barnabas was a major ally of Paul's. Uh, When Paul had first become a Christian, 
and uh, the other leaders of the church were kind of doubting Paul because of his history of persecution, Barnabas stood up for Paul. Barnabas had gone out with Paul on mission trips. Barnabas had faced persecution with Paul. Barnabas had sat beside Paul, preached the same gospel as Paul, and yet right here, even Barnabas gets led astray by Peter's backsliding into legalism. Now, Paul notes that what Peter did here is hypocrisy. The, these Christians in Antioch, they were perfectly fine fellowshipping and eating with the Gentiles and touting that as the way things should be until they were confronted with those who sought to see the Gentile Christians keep Jewish traditions. It's interesting that Paul uses the term uh, hypocrite here. That term actually has its roots in theater, in Greek theater. And these actors would come out and they'd put on these masks to play a role. And so what Paul, the picture that Paul is drawing here is that Peter and Barnabas and these Jewish Christians, they were just putting on this mask of grace, this mask of living out the gospel, and their hearts were actually something else. And then if you look on into verse 14, we see Paul confronting Peter. It says, but when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you though a Jew live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? So why would Paul come and talk to Peter like this? Well, Peter's backsliding, his attempts to conform to legalism put the very heart of the gospel at stake. Peter, by pulling back and identifying with the circumcision party, was essentially building a wall. He was creating a divide between the Jewish Christians who would then view themselves as superior because they followed the law, and the Gentile Christians who would then be seen as inferior because they did not follow Jewish traditions. And so it's this backsliding into this idea that Somehow God loves us more. Somehow God approves of us more because of our actions, because of what we are doing, instead of recognizing the gospel of grace and that the way God views us is contingent upon Jesus Christ and the cross and not upon our own good deeds. And so the gospel, the very heart of the gospel here was being compromised, and Peter was leading other people astray. And now if you look back at verse 11, it says, But when Cephas came to Antioch, Cephas is Peter, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. When the gospel was at stake, Paul did something pretty difficult. Peter was a well-respected member of the church. He was a leader of the church. He was an apostle. He had walked with Jesus Christ. I mean, Peter was everything that a leader in the church should be. But when the gospel was at stake, Paul came to him and confronted him to his face. Church, when the gospel is at stake in our church, in our community, in our world, we have to be like Paul and be willing to stand up for the gospel. Now, that implies a number of things. You have to be uh, knowledgeable on doctrine one of the reasons that we're going to do that doctrine series next year so that if the gospel is being compromised in some way, you can be ready and able to stand up and defend the foundational truths of the Bible. But Paul was ready, and he took the hard path of confronting Peter. Now, the other interesting thing here is that Paul says he confronted Peter to his face. He went right to Peter, right to the source. He didn't beat around the bush. He didn't start rumors in the church. He didn't go to one of Peter's associates and say, hey, hey, uh, why don't you go to Peter and tell him he's causing all these troubles? No, he went right to the source of the problem, taking the hard path of direct confrontation because the gospel was at stake. Uh, today, I mean, we have all different ways of beating around the bush when it comes to confronting people. It, you know, you can send an email, you can leave a Facebook message, you can do this, you can do that. But when it comes to the gospel, church, if it's being compromised in some way, 
you need to go right to the root of the problem. Follow the example of Paul here. Go right to the source and confront it. Now, it's not an easy thing to do. I'm not a confrontational person. I don't like, you know, confronting people when they've done something wrong. It's just not my personality. I don't know a lot of people who it is. It seems like there are some who, you know, crave arguments, but that's not me. But when the gospel's at stake, church, whether it be a, a, a church leader, a fellow church member, whatever, a pastor, it doesn't matter. When the gospel's at stake, you have to stand up and confront it head on. When even though Peter was, I mean, Peter was the ultimate pastor. He'd walked with Jesus, for goodness sakes. But even he messed up. And so Paul took him to task because what he was doing was creating disunity in the church and compromising the gospel and had the potential, well, it was actually leading other people astray. And when the gospel is compromised, other people will be led astray. And that's why we have to be ready to stand up for the truth of the gospel. Now, in this passage, you see, everything just started out good. You know, you, you, had, you had Peter uh, sitting down. He was eating with the Gentiles. Great picture of Christian unity. Great picture. But when he was confronted, when the peer pressure came on, he started to break off that fellowship with the Gentile Christians. He implied their inferiority because they did not keep the traditional Jewish laws. And so Peter put conformity to religious traditions above the gospel of grace. He put conformity to religious traditions above the gospel of grace. Now, even today, even though we may not face the, the Judaizers and the, uh, the temptations that Peter and the Jewish Christians did to fall back into Jewish tradition, we still have to be careful about not falling back into legalism. You know, Peter put on all the trappings of grace. He put on that mask of hypocrisy. But when he was ultimately confronted by the Jewish Christians from Jerusalem, he fell back into legalism. Now, what does that look like today? Well, I was sitting there and I was trying to think. Um, in a Baptist church, sometimes you'll hear the phrase batted about that says, well, we've always done it that way. That's our, that's our tradition. You know, it worked well 30 years ago. It's, it should work the same today. And we, cling, and we cling to that, even though that might actually be compromising the spreading of the gospel. Not that it was bad then, but times change. And so when we cling to something that says we've always done it that way, and when in reality changing something would advance the gospel, we're guilty of the same thing that Peter was. We're clinging to something legalistically, and it's hindering the spread of the gospel. Now, our traditions are good, and they're extremely valuable in the life of our church. But when they become something that hinders the spread of the gospel, it's time to let them go. It's time to look for something else. When we cling to a, tr a tradition that worked well 30 years ago but is now a hindrance, well, we need to follow the example of Paul, not the example of Peter. We should confront that form of legalism head on and see what we can do to change that so that we can advance the gospel in a more effective manner. Church, ultimately... The gospel of Jesus Christ is more important than our traditions. That's where Peter failed. That's where, what he had a hard time seeing. He was so steeped in, the, in his Jewish traditions, and you have to understand, the guy had grown up a Jew. So had these other Jewish Christians. That, that, that was what they knew. And so it was just like putting on a comfortable coat when they fell back into it. And that's how easy it is for us, too, to fall back into our traditions, into our legalism, when what we really need to be concerned about is how is it advancing the gospel of Christ? And so we need to be careful to look at each and every one of our church traditions, uh, everything that we do as a church, and ask ourselves, how is this advancing the gospel? We all have a limited number of hours in our days. We have a limited amount of energy. Uh, as a church, we have a limited number of resources. And so if there is something that we are doing as a church that is not working well, well, we need to look at that, and we need to see what we can do better to advance the gospel today. We need to be like Paul. 
We need to be ready to confront legalism head on for the sake of the gospel of Christ. Because church, Jesus Christ is more important than our traditions. And if conforming to our traditions means compromising the gospel, then the traditions have to go every single time. And sometimes that hurts. I mean, we like, we're comfortable with the way things are, the way things have been, the way things worked uh, a while ago. But when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ, church, that has to win every single time over our traditions and our legalism. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for your word this morning. Thank you for this uh, section about Paul and his life in Galatians where we can learn so much. And Lord, I pray today uh, that you would help us as a church, as individuals, as families. Uh, Holy Spirit, please point out areas in our lives where we are clinging to tradition and legalism and it's hindering the gospel. Point those out to us. Make us aware of them and give us the courage to act on them. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.